Well, I was born in 1932, and that was uh, during the time of the Depression. So I think things were very, very difficult for my family, as well as all the families around me. But we didn't think much of it because we were all poor together, and things were cheap. I mean, you could buy a loaf of bread for 10 cents. And I grew up in a boarding house run by my grandmother and grandfather. And it was in the middle of a Japanese ghetto. My grandmother always warned me to stay in the boundaries, that I must not mingle with anyone who was not Japanese because I could be hurt. So even when I went to school, I just stayed with my Japanese friends. And it was fun, you know, being in kindergarten, being with Walter and Elaine, and we had a great time, but we had to be promoted to the first grade, and my two friends were not promoted. So I did not want to go to first grade, but, you know, you have to go where they tell you to go, and so it was kind of lonely because I did not have any friends in my class to play with. and. Uh, I enjoyed life in Marysville before World War II because the community took care of all the children. They, no matter where you were, someone was looking after you. And we did go to school, which was kind of far away, but um, we just all walked to school. Or when I got older, I was able to ride a roller skate and go to school and come back. It was. Um, now it's called the Kynock School, but I don't know what it was before World War II. It was a very good life, I think, because um, my grandmother and grandfather were there. My parents were a couple of blocks away. The church was three blocks away, and uh, it was a, a very nice kind of a life. I had um, caretakers who were very old because my boarding house was for very old old people. My aunt and uncle ran a boarding house for the younger and more exciting people because they had a very fine boarding house and all the important people stayed at my aunt's boarding house down the street. And uh, it was a very pleasant life until the war came along. I was 10 years old when um, I had a horrific stomach ache. Now, I've always been a very nervous child and had stomach aches all the time. And so when I said I have a stomach ache, no one thought anything of it. They just thought, oh, here's Toshi with another stomach ache, you know, and she's just saying that to get attention, probably. And But I said, I really hurt this time, you know. but. No one did anything. So finally, I must have really screamed or hollered because they did take me to the hospital and found, they found out I had appendicitis and they would have to operate immediately. So I had the operation and I was in this ride out hospital. And uh, the first day or so, I had visitors. I think my parents came, but um, I don't remember too many other people coming. And then no one came to visit me except my father's friend. He had a Caucasian friend who I think supplied him with the ice cream for the ice cream parley. And I thought it was strange because, you know, if you're in the hospital, normally the parents would come and see you. But I didn't know that there was no one left in the town to come and visit me because everyone had been evacuated and sent to Tule Lake. And finally, the army came after me, and uh, they put me on a stretcher to put me on this train that was going north. And I know that they couldn't get the stretcher into the train, so they opened the window, slid me through there, and I remember that because when I got in there, all the shades were drawn. It was a very dark, dark train, and I thought, this is really weird, but anyway, we got to our destination, which was Tule Lake. I didn't know that 
that particular train trip was really going to change my whole life, that it was never going to be as it was before. I was uh, brought into this barrack, and, you know, the landscape was so strange because I saw nothing but sand, and I thought, gee, how can I be going north and I'm in the middle of a desert because Tule Lake was all sand. But I was very happy because um, my family were all there waiting for me, and uh, then my life began inside Tule Lake. And it was, it was fine. I, you know, for children, I think it was not too bad because your whole family, your whole neighborhood is in one area, in the Block 48. My, my whole family was in this one barrack. My mother, father, and my sister in a room. My mother, my grandmother, grandfather, and I were in the next room. My aunt and uncle and his family were there, and another relative on this side. So all of us, I think there were six rooms to each barrack, and we fit neatly into this one barrack. So it was difficult to um, go to the bathroom or to eat or things like that. But I think that for a child, it was a very nourishing kind of a, a, for me, it was very, very good inside the camp, I think, because everybody was just right there, you know, and they all took excellent care of me. It was just like being in the ghetto, except even more so, because they were just right around you. I thought the school was very good because I went to English school, American school in the morning for, I guess, three or four hours. And in the afternoon, I had everything in Japanese. So I had American history, geography, math, English. In the afternoon, I had Japanese language. I learned how to read and write Japanese history and Japanese geography. I learned every single mountain and every single volcano, I mean the volcanoes and the um, lakes of Japan. And we had to learn the abacus, and you had to be very proficient at the abacus. And thanks to that, my um, math is um, great. I mean, I've always enjoyed math because I had it in two languages. So um, in the evening, we were taught how to uh, write Japanese with a brush. And the weekends, we, um, my mother, um, I guess, got me uh, some lessons in Japanese dance and a Japanese instrument called the shamisen. And on Sunday, we went to church. And uh, the church was a barrack that was um, turned into a church. Just the year before I went to camp, um, my mother and father or somebody had purchased a piano for me because I had been wanting to play the piano since I was about five years old. And uh, one day the piano just appeared at the boarding house and uh, my uh, parents gave me 50 cents to take lessons in the town of Yuba City, which is next door. So I was able to do that. But unfortunately, I was, um, I was having lessons for a whole year, and then we had to move to Tule Lake, and they wouldn't let me take the piano, of course, let alone a little bag. But when I got in the camp and started going to church, they allowed me to play the little pump organ that they had brought from Marysville in this Buddhist church. So after church was over, I practiced for a long time on the pump organ. So I got to know all the Buddhist hymns, and uh, it came in handy because when I came out, they asked me to play for the church. And so it was, you know, it enabled me to continue with my uh, learning how to read and play the piano. And so all these activities, I think, were very good for the children. Because we were going to be sent to Japan, my father was a no-no person in that um, he had to give up his citizenship so he could take 
my grandmother and grandfather back to Japan. They were adamant that they wanted to be buried in Japan and they wanted to go back to Japan. So they wanted us to be equal to a Japanese student in Japan. So we had to study very hard. I was in the fifth grade um, in Japanese school. In the morning, um, we had to do um, a good exercise program. We ran around the ward every morning before breakfast. We went into rows and did calisthenics just like the Japanese children. And then we went to breakfast. And after breakfast, we went to American school. But I think having that kind of an experience, I've always loved to do um, physical things. I like jogging. I, I do like to walk and, and do all these things. Um, and I think it started when I was in the, constant, in the internment camp. I think it was a time when um, the children were influenced a lot. And one of the strange things that we did is that uh, the Red Cross would send us yarn, uh, black yarn, because they wanted us to uh, knit and crochet shawls for the refugees in Europe. And I thought that was kind of ironic. Here we are in the camp, and they're asking us to do somebody that's, I mean, they were, of course, having a rough time in Europe, but they were not in an internment camp like we were. And I just thought that was very strange. But I did learn how to do a lot of hand things. There were a lot of riots and things that occurred. And I know, I think probably afterwards, but I don't really remember too much except that I do remember that the tanks would come in sometimes, you know, into the camp and um, they said they were looking for somebody, but of course we were not allowed to leave. That was the only scary part. I mean, uh, there were riots, um, food riots or something, and uh, my uncle was caught in the riot. He was not one of the instigators or anything, but somehow he was standing in the wrong place. So he got put into jail. And there was a jail within the camp. So people who did bad things were sent in there, you know, into the... But a lot of things occurred that um, it's like, um, because circumstances were so abnormal, like next door to me, there was a, um, a sake making, um, well, it was a facility for making sake. So someone got some rice and, you know, they would go in there and make the sake and sell it. But there was no other way, I guess, for people to get sake. So I don't think that people really, um, looked into matters like that because it was a necessity for some people to have their sake drink. And people just made it and sold it and it was not considered uh, illegal or anything to do it. I think eventually they were caught, but it was there for a long time. Because you don't want to go into the room because the room smelled awful, you know. For myself, I did not feel, well, I did feel um, prejudice after the war because um, when my husband and I decided to get married, of course, we moved to Sacramento, we lived here, and we needed a place to stay after we got married. But um, I had all these newspaper ads for rent. We'd go and they'd look at us and said, oh, it's taken, or we don't want you, or some. And so I said, Goro, I guess we're not going to get married. We can't find any place to stay. But uh, we went to 24th and the Castro, and uh, there was a for rent sign there. And so we went to see this Mr. Munger, and uh, I said, oh, will you rent the house to us? And he said, sure. And I said, you're sure you're going to rent it? So Mr. Munger, who lived there, uh, just um, just was wonderful. He rented the house to us, and so we were able to get married. 
and have all these things. But I didn't feel it until then, until 1956. Um, I guess there were other things that happened, but it just never bothered me until that moment. You know, I don't think uh, there was any uh, other prejudice that I felt, you know, or I did not feel bitter because I thought it was normal for us to be in the concentration camp. I thought everybody was there. I thought this was a normal thing for everyone to go into the camp and be inside that camp because I didn't know that there were other options open to me. I thought this was it, you know, everybody did it. And so I didn't think it was strange or funny. That was just how life was. Japanese. Because I was Japanese. My grandmother's sister, uh, Mrs. Fukui, became the matriarch of my cousin's family. And she was a very, very tough old lady. I mean, I think she's tougher than any man that I have met. She could take a snake and, you know, cut it down in half. I mean, she was. And I think you had to be tough in those days to survive. And my grandmother was tough, but not as tough as her old, you know. I think she was an older sister. But I think my grandmother, um, to me, um, was an extremely healthy person. I mean, to be 100 and be able to walk miles, I mean, and do everything herself. I mean, she was, um, and for me, she set the example for being a healthy person. She got up every morning at the crack of dawn, and she faced the sun. And of course, the first thing she did was to say, Banzai to the emperor, because, you know, he was still her emperor. And she went through all these calisthenics, which I followed, whatever she did. And then she went, sat down, and uh, she prayed to her. And I could still smell the incense, because I could smell that before I, the first thing in the morning, and she lit the incense, did, and she prayed to her Buddhist. I guess she was a Buddhist, and she was Odaishi san. She had several religions that she kind of had them all. And I think in Japan they have uh, whatever suits them, you know, and she had uh, one where um, I guess partly Shintoism and the Buddhism and Odaishi-san, which her uh, sister in Hawaii had started. But uh, I think for the older people like her, they needed the religion. They needed something to believe in because life was so harsh and she um, tried to raise me as a Buddhist. And um, my two grandmothers, they were very powerful women and she, they were both very religious. As opposed to my grandfather who was anti-religion. First of all, I would like to have them not see color in the people around them because I think that causes a lot of grief. Uh, well, for me, because I, I did, when I went to school, I did want to make friends with everyone, but my grandmother had said, you know, um, you, you just play with your Japanese friends, and I did comply. And um, if you start at an early age, I don't think you would see color as much, but when you grow up, you carry these prejudices all the way until you die. So I think it's important in the schools, especially um, for little kids, to learn that everybody is exactly the same inside and not to um, judge them because of the color of their face or because they are handicapped in one way or another or, or anything. Because I think that's what causes a lot of uh, problems on this earth. I mean, and to be uh, not judgmental, but not to um, 
have religion get in the way of uh, friendships or countries or anything to try to get along even if you think one way and I think another way because I think everybody can get along if uh, they don't let their own prejudices get in the way. I, I just uh, um, I just admire people who go on these peace marches or or work for the Peace Corps and try to better the world. And I, I would truly like to have um, one world country and not have any barriers between countries. And uh, that's probably for me the best uh, ideal world. Because uh, I, I, I see that now in my own little group. I had, uh, I have a Japanese folk dance group on Monday night, and um, the uh, people that were who were in the group were from Japan, and I had a difficult time because I think they probably might have seen me as an American with a Japanese face. I saw them, you know, as being from Japan. And I had to get along with these people, but it was very difficult because I saw them in, I saw in them a lot of Japanese-ness that I did not have because I was born and raised here and I thought like an American. And uh, that was bad on my part, you know, part to be prejudiced like that because eventually, because we both love dance, all of us, all of their group and, and myself, we love dance, and we got together every Monday night to do this dancing. Eventually, I grew to l really like the ladies, but it was very difficult because I had this barrier about people who are not like me, and they're not. Now, and of course, I had to speak Japanese every Monday night. Now, all those ladies have passed on except for one or two, and now it is totally a different picture because these are all third generation Japanese and they don't speak, well, maybe a few words of Japanese. And I think they see the world in an entirely different light than when I was growing up. They, I have uh, my nephew's daughter who is Caucasian in the group. I've got uh, Chinese, two or three Chinese ladies and uh, uh, you know, before World War II, we had lots of prejudice, not only against the Caucasian, but against the Chinese, because my grandmother said, you know, you are um, Japanese, Chinese, that China and Japan were at war. You, um, you cannot be friends with Chinese either. Now I have some of my best friends are Chinese because I do Tai Chi and uh, I, I just really enjoy being in the Renaissance of which there are not too many Japanese but they are all people from all over and I've enjoyed their friendships and I just think it's great that I was able to overcome you know what my grandmother had taught me <laughs> and accepted people for who they are. I just think it's wonderful for me, anyway. <laughs>